quick announcements this morning. The food pantry uh, truck arrival days and then the food, food pantry um, is a little off this week. Um, so this Tuesday, the food pantry truck is going to get here to the church somewhere around 10, 30, and 11. So um, if you, anybody can come and help unload, it shouldn't take too long to unload that and put some things away. But the food pantry actually is not going to be till the 21st, so the following a Wednesday from 12 to 4. So if you can help with the food pantry, we definitely could use help in that. So the truck's coming this Tuesday, and then the food pantry will actually be next following Wednesday. Normally it's a Tuesday, Wednesday thing, but they're off a little bit this week. Also, just a reminder, um, uh, we uh, postponed last Sunday evening's events here at the church. So the, normally the first Sunday of the month we have um, events here for the women we call LACE, and then men, man-to-man, will be tonight at 6.30 to about 8 o'clock or so. Um, so if you could come out to that, I would um, encourage you guys uh, to do that. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we do thank you, Lord, as Tim prayed, that we can, we're just free to assemble, to come and gather together um, in Christ as the body of Christ, Lord, to worship him and to lift him up, Lord, to remember the things, Lord, that he has done for us. Uh, the very reason we gather here this morning is because of that. And, and so, Lord, we pray that our worship uh, through song this morning was pleasing to you, Lord, that you were honored and glorified in our lives. And, and so now, Lord, I pray that as we open up your word this morning, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, as even Tim prayed this morning, Lord, I pray that uh, the words that I have to say this morning, that are not my words or my opinions or thoughts, Lord, but it's your word that is going forth, that changes lives, Lord, that gives us the discernment that we need to live in this world. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given it to us in written form so we can spend time in it, page from page, just studying precept upon precept, knowing, Lord, that it's your word that brings life and it's your word that guides and strengthens us on our way home. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing here. I ask you to minister to those that are sick this morning, that are struggling, or that your grace would be sufficient for them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I got a little bit of a I don't want to say it's a tough message. It's something that I've had to wrestle with a good bit this week uh, because of the question that we're still in and we'll be in. Uh, I promise it will be over. I really promise that it will be over this question next Sunday. Um, so for, if you guys, anybody here is visiting with us, um, in December I asked you guys to submit some questions that, that might be on your mind and then we would answer them here in the beginning of 2018. So we're looking at this second question. Um, and the question um, that... that I have is this. It's what is apologetics and is every Christian called to it? Is every Christian called uh, to apologetics? And the reason why I want to spend some time, I have been spending some time um, in this question, because I believe that uh, when we understand what it means to uh, be an apologist, kind of what uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 says, be able to defend the faith. We looked at a couple aspects of, of what, is apolog what is an apologist. It's just one who's able to defend or to explain or re uh, give reason for why Christians, why we believe what we believe, um, and you know, and then the, you know, the second part of that question really is, you know, is each one of us called to that ministry? And I believe at some level we all are. There are people that are that are definitely a gifted apologist. Where that's just kind of what they do. Um, but I believe all of us should be um, kind of in that ministry, so to speak, uh, being able to defend the faith or share the faith with others. And that's what First Peter three and verse fifteen talks about. But I believe it's important for us to know um, how to do that because you know, with these questions that we're going to be looking at for several months probably, um, all of us should be able to, at some level to be able to answer or give some level of an answer for uh, the different things that people might ask us about um, our walk with um, Christ. And so we looked at those two reasons why we should do apologetics. We already talked about the first one, and those verses will be up on the screen there, uh, this idea of soul winning and disciple making, going out into the world and making disciples um, as apologists, giving a reason or a defense of why we believe what we believe and then trusting that God is going to bless what we have to say. Uh, we talked a little bit about what the gospel looks like. Uh, we know that's the power of God to salvation. Paul says that in Romans 1.16, to those that will believe. And so we have to be able to articulate the gospel, and that's all of the gospel. You know, and so we talked about some of the bad news of the gospel. I was reading somebody, his name is Steve Lawson. He's a pastor. Um, does a lot of stuff with expository uh, preaching and teaching. But he says, you know, uh, he says the bad news can only be, you know, you only understand the bad news is when you understand the good news. When you understand how bad the bad news is, the good news is even greater. And we understand kind of what that gospel message is. And Paul understood that message. Um, that's why a lot of times you'll see him writing how thankful he is that, that God set him apart to be an apostle. 
uh, that, that God was merciful to him, you know, in the state that he was in prior to coming to faith in Christ. You know, he was persecuting the church, killing Christians, and, and so Paul knew kind of the bad news in that, um, but realized how great that good news is, that the gospel message is. So Paul was very faithful with sharing, you know, what the gospel is to people, and God honored that, and many lives came to faith and to know Christ through uh, the ministry of Paul. The second thing that we've been talking about last Sunday, and then we're going to talk about today and the next Sunday, is the second aspect of what it means to be an apologist, and that is to defend or to guard the faith. You know, are we equipped enough to defend our faith or to guard the faith? And then the question should also come is, do we even know the faith? Do we know what we're defending, and do we know uh, what we're guarding um, it against? And so we started last Sunday talking about, and really what I did was try to lay the groundwork from God's Word about, you know, who we are defending the faith or guarding the faith against. And the scripture teaches us that that's against false teachers or false apostles, false prophets that kind of sneak into the church and bring in their, dest- their destructive heresies, the scripture teaches us. And so that's who we are to kind of defend the faith against kind of putting an end to their message, cutting off what they're teaching uh, to people. So we looked at that uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, you know, spent a little bit of time in Matthew 24, uh, where Jesus laid out that the end times when the apostles came, or the disciples then came to him was asking some questions, and if you remember, there's three times within Matthew 24 that he would say things like, take heed, be on guard, uh, false teachers were going to come, and he repeated that, uh, that, that topic more than anything else he talked about in their false teachers, false Christ, coming in and presenting a different uh, Jesus. Uh, we looked at some places where Paul spoke about it as well, Peter and John, uh, just encouraging us to be on guard against that, and then being able to do the, the work of an apologist to defend the faith um, and to speak truth into people's uh, lives And so this morning what I want to do, and this is why it's been a difficult week for me, even this morning I was even reading some stuff. Um, this morning what I want to do is I want to identify some fruit or some characteristics of what a false teacher looks like. So we can talk about they're out there. And the, we looked at this last Sunday. Jesus talked about, all these other guys talked about, that there are going to be many of them that are going to creep into where? The church. They're not, I mean, they're from the outside. Paul uh, exhorts the Ephesian elders in Ephesians chapter 20 to take heed to themselves, but also to the flock of God, that these wolves and these people will come in from the outside creeping in. He says, but also from the inside men will rise up, um, basically perverting the truth and drawing disciples after uh, themselves. And so uh, what uh, I'm more concerned about is for us as the storehouse is that we're on guard against people coming in and perverting the gospel, presenting maybe a different Jesus, a different gospel, trying to talk about a different spirit, and that we would actually might listen to that. Um, you know, Paul was concerned about the church there in Corinth when we looked at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that he was concerned that, that they would have an influence, these false teachers would have an influence there um, in the church. And so uh, this second point of being an apologist, this defending or guarding the faith, uh, we uh, kind of are springboarding out of Jude's, um, writing this short letter that Jude writes, um, and I would strongly encourage you to read this letter. It probably would take you just a couple minutes to read through it. It's real short, um, right there close to the end of the Bible, second book um, from the, on the other side of Revelation. But Jude gives the main reason for writing his letter as kind of um, cutting, cutting a, a short the ministry of these, if you want to call it a ministry, of these false teachers. He wrote specifically about the people that have crept in unnoticed. And then through the letter, it's a short letter, he gives... Um, some examples of what they look like, talks about some characteristics on a false teacher. So I'd encourage you to read through the, through the short letter of Jude. So this morning I'm going to start with that in Jude chapter 1, and really it's just verses, it's just one chapter um, in Jude. We're going to look at 1 and 4 where he um, um, exhorts us to contend for the faith. And then 11, uh, verses 11 down to the beginning of 13 where he gives three examples from the Old Testament, what these people look like as they crept in to the church. So Jude says this, He says, Judah, servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, uh, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was uh, very eager to write to you about our common salvation, so initially it was probably going to be a letter of encouragement, just kind of talking about the salvation that they all enjoyed in Christ, the true gospel. This is, so he kind of changed his mind. He says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And this is the reason why, verse 4, for certain people have crept in into your gatherings, into the church, unnoticed, who long ago were designed for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. And then he gives these examples in 11 down through 13. Like I said, I would encourage you to read the entire letter 
with it to keep within context, but this is what he says what these people are going to look like. And so he gives these examples out of the Old Testament, starting there in verse 11. He says, Woe to them, referring to these people that have crept in unnoticed, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts. And, and back then, that's what they, they would gather. They, um, they would enjoy meals, love meals, love fellowship meals together. It's just basically they were having fellowship. That's what they called it, love feasts. As a church would gather together, they, would, they were spots in these love feasts. They were kind of a blemish in the life of the Christian church back then. It says, while they feast with you, so they're in your midst, without fear, serving only um, themselves. And so Jude warns us about them, that they've crept in, you know, he writes this letter somewhere probably at the close of the first century, within those last 20 years or so of the close of the first century. And the question as I look at this is, you know, we're, we're sitting almost, not quite, 2,000 years this side of that letter. How many of these folks have been creeping in over the years? Unchecked. Un, you know, and, and the thing as I look at this, and we're going to look at Second Peter, we looked at a lot of that last Sunday, is, is that these false teachers, you know, they don't come in and announce themselves, hey, I'm a false teacher. And I'm going to join your midst. They creep in unnoticed. They're perverted. They're deceptive. They, uh, matter of fact, Paul says that they are. Um, they can actually uh, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Second Corinthians 11. We know that one passage that Satan, what, disguises himself as an angel of light. He looks very good. He says, and no wonder that's just how they are. But the ministers that are working for him are having. They have the ability to transform themselves into ministers of what, righteousness. They look very good. They're very hard to pick out, but he gives a couple examples, and we're going to work down through this as we talk about some things this morning. You know, the, the Cain, he gives the example, they've gone in the way of Cain. They've kind of looked like uh, what Balaam, if you understand Balaam, if you study uh, the book of Numbers, uh, what Balaam's life was all about, and they were rebellious like Korah who rebelled against the authority of Moses, and you can read that as well in Numbers chapter 16, but um, I'm going to look at Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and we looked at this last Sunday. Um, if you were actually to, to look at these, the section Jude and then Second Peter, and specifically Second Peter chapter 2, and if you pay attention to this language, what I probably should have done was, was place Second Peter above Jude and read it kind of in order. I, 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 for me, as I read it, I think that there's order there. Listen to what Peter says uh, in Second Peter chapter 2, and really that whole entire chapter, he talks about these false teachers and then kind of describes what they look like. Um, in a similar fashion as uh, Jude does. But Second Peter chapter 2, and verses 1 and 2, Peter tells us this. He says, but there were, as a matter of fact, there were also false prophets among the people, referring back to the Old Testament, even as there will be false teachers among you within the church who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. It says, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. So this is what they attack. They attack truth. They, or they water down truth. They, um, they present, like they're ministers of righteousness, they present something, maybe 75, 80% of the stuff they're saying or how they live their life is pretty good, but it's the poison, it's that danger that they bring in. They begin to attack truth with I believe is the word of God. They attack who Christ is, the deity of Jesus, and him being the Messiah. They attack the gospel of truth. There's a lot of things that they're attacking there, which is God's uh, truth. But notice the language. It says, even as there will be false teachers among you. It's almost like Peter's looking ahead. As the Holy Spirit moves on, on the Apostle Peter, he's looking ahead and saying, this is their coming. They're going to come into the church. And then when we read Jude chapter 1, they've arrived. They've arrived. They're, they've already crept in. So in that short period of time when Peter writes and then the Jude writes, they've already got there. So, like I said, we live in 2018. They have been creeping in regularly into the church. Into the church. And I said this last Sunday. I don't encourage anybody to look around here and wonder. I know most of the people that sit in here. I believe everybody here has a walk with the Lord. Um, but the false teachers will come in and we should check them. Um, <clears throat> For time's sake this morning, I was back and forth. I had to delete a lot of stuff. But I wanted to read for you because of what Peter says here, but there were also false prophets among the people, uh, referring to the Old Testament, really the nation of Israel. If you look at the divided kingdoms, Israel and Judah. But um, I wanted to read to you what God, how, what God thinks about false teachers among his people. And I wanted to read you the entire chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 23. So all I'm going to say this morning, I'm not going to read it. I would encourage you to read Jeremiah 23. 
And we're going to look at a little bit of Ezekiel 34, uh, where God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah. He also speaks through Israel about what, how God, what God thinks about false teachers. He knows who they are. He's, he looks down and he sees them. And they're among the people. And, they, you know, and they're, uh, the, the problem with, as you read that section, is and he has a heart for his sheep as these false shepherds were talking things that weren't from God. They were uh, perverting all kinds of stuff. They were living off of the people instead of feeding the people the word of God. And so judgment had to come. And if you understand Jeremiah and Ezekiel, a lot of those, those, those prophets during that time, captivity was coming for them to go into Babylon. God still had to judge his people because of the idolatry and the sin that they fell into because of their bad teachers. But God held the teachers responsible, even though he took the people into a captivity. When I was looking at Ezekiel 34, and he speaks a little bit about that, and we're going to look at that briefly this morning, it reminded me to jump back a chapter to Ezekiel 33, um, because as I was reading Ezekiel 33 in light of Acts chapter 20, when Paul is exhorting the Ephesian elders to take care of the flock of God, um, and the one thing that Paul says there um, in Acts chapter 20 is this, he says, you know what, um, I am innocent of all the blood of men, all the blood uh, of people that I have shared Christ with, uh, shared the gospel with, I'm innocent because I've given it to them completely. He says, I'm not shunned to declare to you the entire counsel of God. He taught them God's word. So if you go back to Ezekiel chapter 33, before God talks through Ezekiel to, uh, you know, looking at these false shepherds in Ezekiel 34, um, he calls Ezekiel to be a watchman. If you know that account, he says, son of man, this is what I'm going to call you to do, to be a watchman of the house of Israel. And this is what you're supposed to do. He says, when the sword comes, if you notice the sword coming, if you notice something coming against my people, against the house of Israel, he says, as a faithful and good watchman, he says, you're to blow the trumpet. You're to warn the house of Israel when the sword comes. He says, if you're a faithful watchman, and this is what Paul was saying, that I've been a faithful watchman. I've given you the entire gospel, given you God's word. Uh, he says to Ezekiel, when you blow the trumpet and you warn the people, and if the people turn from their sin, they confess their iniquity, they turn from what's coming, he says they will be saved, and uh, Ezekiel has done his job. He said, but if Ezekiel, he, he, he warns the people, he blows the trumpet, and says, you know, the sword's coming, but the people fail to repent, or the people fail to turn or take heed of the watchman's call, they're going to die in their sin. And, but Ezekiel is still okay. This is the one that's dangerous. Because what God says in Ezekiel 33, he says this. He says, Ezekiel, now, if you see the sword coming, but you fail to blow the trumpet, you don't warn my people. He says, they're still going to die in their sin if they don't turn. They're still, gonna, they're still responsible for the lives that they live. But he says, I will require their blood on your head. That's some pretty tough language. And so as I think about that in Ezekiel 33, and I think of a, the, uh, the exhortation that Paul gives to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, because it's similar language. Paul is simply saying, and he could say it with confidence, God's not going to require all, your guys' blood and all those people that I was speaking to about the gospel because I've given it to them. Now, what they do with the gospel, how they respond to the message of God is on them. But I'm still faithful. But the, the people in the Old Testament, these old prophets, these old false teachers, they weren't doing those things. And we're going to see some of the characteristics of these false teachers. Listen to what Matthew chapter 7 uh, verses 13 to the, to the end of uh, 16 there, and then uh, verse 20 says, Jesus speaking here as he kind of is moving towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, teaching his disciples the things about the kingdom of God. I actually wanted to include all the way from verse 13 to the very end of chapter 7, just a lot there, because I think it all kind of ties in. But listen to what he says, and we're familiar with these verses. Now he's speaking to his disciples. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now listen to what he says. Because this is a complete conversation, this is a complete thing that he's talking about here. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look very religious. But inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. And then he ends that section as he's talking about these folks. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Uh, the reason why I included this, this section that we we're familiar with, Enter by the Narrow Gate, I really wanted to, to, to uh, include the next section all the way down to the, um, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, is simply this. False teachers will present to you the wide gate, the wide path. It's easy to get in. Just kind of do these things. You know, enter by the narrow gate. Don't listen. What I, what I hear Christ saying is don't listen to these false prophets, these false teachers. The, the narrow gate is what? 
Number one, it's narrow and it's difficult. But the good news is that it's leading to life. No matter how difficult this path is as we walk with Christ, it still leads to life. And if you look in John chapter 10, Jesus talks about who is the gate. Who's the gate? He is. I am the gate and my sheep go in by me. I am the gate. Yes, it's a difficult path. It's a narrow path. That's why in Luke 14, Jesus tells us that we have to count the cost. This walk with him is going to be difficult. And we're going to see here as we pick down through Jude, as he talks about Cain and, and Balaam and Korah and some other folks in here, that people today, these false teachers, remember he says there are many of them coming. They're coming all over the place, creeping into the church, and people are going to listen to them because they have itching ears. They're going to present to you um, all the things that appeal to your flesh, the temporary things. Because the gate to, to eternal life, he says, is difficult, but it's a leading to eternal life, and few people find it. And so as we looked at that section there in 15 down in 16, he says, beware of these people. And he says, but you're going to know them by their fruits. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to look at uh, four things, and I, I had a several other ones, which I just kind of narrowed it to four. Of, uh, what, are the, what does these characteristics look like of a false teacher? What, do, uh, what is the fruit, as Jesus says here, what is the fruit of a false teacher? And I think it's so important for us today, especially in 2018, uh, that we have discerning eyes. Our ears pick things up. We, we listen carefully. And this is the reason why. I mean, I don't know what tomorrow brings and what technology brings in the next year or two or how much time we got, I don't know. But I know as I sit here this morning in 2018, we are bombarded by so much stuff. The television, internet, social media, books, conferences. I mean, it's just from everything, you, there's so much stuff out here that we can read. You know, I remember a story as I was, while I was thinking about this. Um, I'm actually going to be 20 years old next month. I don't know if you guys knew that. Actually, to be honest with you, I'm going to be 50 next Wednesday, which is crazy. But, um, I, can't, I can't believe how quick time goes by. James will catch up. We already had that conversation. But that's another thing. He's still a young guy. Um, but no, I was just... So next month, it was 20 years ago, my wife and I came to Christ. March, third Sunday, March 1998. So I know the Sunday, so I'm really just 20 years old even though I look almost like I'm 50. Um, but I remember when I came to faith in Christ that, that March in 98, and um, I, I just remember the day, as a Sunday, uh, we came to Christ, and just that, what Jesus talked about, born-again experience. I, got, I had new eyes, new ears. Just everything was changed. I didn't know much, but I knew something was powerfully different in my life. I mean, Trace and I, I mean, both of us were like that, and just God did a work in our lives. And, and I was hungry for truth. I was, we, 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 I mean, what did we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, part of every kind of group, just desiring to grow and, and so I was just kind of gobbling up all the books that were out there. If it claimed to be Christian, I was reading it. And at the time, I was working for the Department of Defense down in Fort Detrick, down in Maryland, and I had a book. If I said the author this morning, you, most of you probably would know him. I was reading this book, and I was just, I was intrigued by the book. Like I said, I was a new Christian. I didn't know, I didn't know a whole lot. And I was just so interested in the book, and I was reading through it. And most of you, if you know me, I'm not a beginning-to-end book reader. Um, but I was chewing through this book. I really liked what this guy was saying. And about halfway through this book, I was, I was working. I remember it was like yesterday. I remember I was working a night shift, and I was fueling this government vehicle up. And um, as, the, as it was fueling, I had the book out standing between. I still remember standing between the gas pump and this vehicle, reading this book, just, man, this is so interesting. And I, just, and I remember the Holy Spirit came to me and says, throw it away. Throw it away. And I was like, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but have you ever had those moments when the Holy Spirit speaks to you like that? I mean, it's, it's crystal clear. You know it's His voice. Um, and I, I remember, like, I, I felt kind of creeped out, to be honest with you. I was like, what is that feeling? Like, I really like this book. And it just, I was arguing with, at the time, the Holy Spirit didn't really realize. Remember, we have an anointing, First John 2 tells us, that we might know all things. He guides us. He leads us. He protects us. He leads us into all truth. That's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. He, and what he was telling me is what you're reading is not true. It's perverted. And this is a, 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 um, a well-liked, well-read person. And I, I wrestled with that. Like, well, I was trying to come up with all kinds of stupid things. Well, you know, this book cost me $20. And this, you know, it's like, you know, you know, I'm actually reading, like, for the, you know, really reading. And the Holy Spirit was just very gracious to throw it away. It's not going to be good for you. And I remember when I finally gave in. I took the book and I threw it in one of those trash cans I have next to the gas pumps. As soon as it hit the bottom, I was completely relieved. Never thought about that book again. 
and I began to grow. You see, there's so much stuff. That's why we have to have the, the ability to discern. Uh, Paul tells us in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, good from evil or right from wrong. You know, uh, we've, I've quoted this often here. Charles Spurgeon says, you know, discernment isn't the ability to, to recognize right from wrong, but it's the ability to recognize right from just almost right. See, when false teachers creep in and these ministers train themselves up and transform themselves up as ministers of righteousness, they look pretty good. They're hard to detect. That's why it's so important for us to be walking with the Spirit, that we know God's Word, that we're sensitive to His voice. So when He comes to you and says, throw the book away, you're quicker at throwing away than I was. And I see now, as I know this guy, and I have followed him, not followed him, I know about him for 20 years, I, ex I know why the Holy Spirit told me to throw that book away. That's why it's so important for us to have discernment, because, like I said, the time that we live in, there's so much stuff that can influence us. Um, I was talking to somebody this morning. Um, if you're Facebook people or social media people, I mean, if you understand, like you watch Facebook, you know, you get these um, recommendations on Facebook. Like if you've liked or done something, which is kind of scary and spooky that Facebook can do this, you've liked or you've watched something, they'll give you recommendations that's pretty close, like associated with whatever it is. You, now, they don't have the ability to discern a good teacher and a false teacher. They just will recommend something that's Christian. And, um, and I watch this on Facebook, these recommendations that come, and I'm like, why in the world is Facebook recommending this guy? He's crazy. You know, I was probably looking at who knows what or watching a video from whomever, uh, people that I think are good, good teachers, and they'll recommend those. And I will watch this, and I'll begin to listen to it. And what they'll do, normally do is they'll give you about a, a minute and a half or two-minute um, part of their message. And I'll listen to them. I was like, this guy is so far in left field, it's unbelievable. But then I'll look at, you know, 287 likes, or 287,000 likes, 1,900 comments. So I start looking at the comments. Oh, this guy's preaching truth, man, preach it, brother. And I'm like, what's he preaching? He's not preaching Christ, he's not preaching the gospel, he's not, he definitely doesn't have the word of God out in front of him, and I have one here only for my eye's sake, it's right here in front of me. I have the Bible. I don't have my, what you see on the screen is on my notes. I don't have a whole lot here on my notes. It's just God's word. And we have to be on that's why we have to be careful. So many things come at us. This is not going to be on the screen. I was reading this yesterday after I had put the PowerPoint together. Um, you guys know um, that I like A.W. Tozer. You're not saying he's a perfect guy. Um, I'm just saying I like him. I resonate to, uh, towards some of the things that he has to say and what he writes about. And so I read this yesterday in light of thinking about, uh, you know, these four characteristics that I want to talk about of what a false teacher looks like, what that fruit looks like. Tozer says this. He says, what's closest to your heart is what you talk about. And if God is close to your heart, you will talk about him. What's closest to your heart, that's the things that you're going to talk about. And if God is there, that's going to be your conversation. It's going to be your conversation. And so when you look at these people that, uh, that present themselves as pastors or teachers or whatever out there, and I'm not saying everybody out there is bad. And I'm also not saying that um, some people will actually get down on meg what they call mega churches, churches with uh, thousands and thousands of people. And I'm not saying all mega churches are bad either. I know uh, pastors of church. Uh, uh, a matter of fact, I know one guy. I know his teaching. I think he's a good, solid guy. And he pastors a church of 18,000 people. And it's a good church. I'm not saying that he doesn't have false stuff up in there. That's just a big church, and you can easily hide yourself there. But, um, but I know the pastoral staff, that they're solid people. But I also know churches that have a boatload of people that are they're very questionable. And sometimes what we do is we'll watch them all, thinking that there's somehow truth in all this, and not being able to discern or recognize that one false teacher that looks very good. He's transformed himself into a minister of righteousness, and he sounds Christian, but there's some things off about him. So what I want to do this morning is I want to look at four characteristics, quickly go down through these. I've got some stuff here, actually a significant amount of scripture. Um, four characteristics of what I believe a false teacher looks like. Now I was looking through Jude, the section we looked at, actually the whole letter of Jude. I was spending some time in 2 Peter, uh, Matthew 24, uh, 1 John, 2 John, Revelation 2. 2. I mean, there's all kinds of places you can go, uh, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, other places outside the Old Testament, I mean, those two books in the Old Testament, to kind of look at, because Jesus says you'll know them. These people you will know by their characteristic or how they act, what they say. You'll know them by their fruit. So since he says that, he says we can know them. And so I've had to spend some time, and I, like I was sharing with someone this morning, 
But we also have to be careful when we kind of pull the trigger, so to speak, on somebody and call them a heretic or a false teacher. You know, we have to do our homework. We have to spend time really, what are they saying? What do they believe? You know, or, or could they just be, could they be a child of God and just be off a little bit? Because let's be honest this morning, sometimes we're off a little bit. I mean, that's, that's just the truth of it. So I'm very careful, and, and I almost, and I didn't do it this morning, I almost was going to put a list of some people on the screen at the very end. I'm just let you guys chew on it for a little bit. Some people that I have done homework on. I've, I've listened to the message. I've listened to, I've read their stuff. And it's the, for me, the, per, the people that I think have red flags or are dangerous are the ones that continue to say the same stuff that's not biblical over and over and over again, never repenting of it, leading people down a wrong path. I know sometimes you will say things, and I'm sure I have said things that's not biblical. Um, I, um, who, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this. This is just coming to my mind. Um, has anybody read anything uh, um, from some people that have uh, kind of blasted uh, Billy Graham? Who here knows Billy? I mean, I think every does everybody know Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, the Graham, you know, the Graham Association on North Carolina. Some people have actually blasted Billy Graham. I'm careful with that. I know I've read the things that they talk about him. Um, you know, there was a conversation that he had with, if you guys are familiar with Robert Schuler back in uh, the '90s, the Crystal Cathedral guy in California. Um, I actually heard this one with my own ears. He was doing a crusade in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I listened to the radio interview, and I heard him say that there were other paths to God other than Christ. I heard, him, I heard that North Carolina accent. He said the same thing to Robert Shuler when Robert Shuler asked him this question, something similar. He said the same thing. Is, does Billy Graham really believe that, or was he caught in a moment? And I'm not giving him this excuse, but was he just caught in a moment? Don't we all get caught in moments? When someone asks us for hope, they're, they're struggling with something in life, and then all of a sudden you give them everything else than the true hope? We get caught in moments. And I'm not saying anything with Billy Graham. I don't read a lot of Billy Graham. I don't really follow him. But that's why I'm saying you've got to be careful sometimes. I, I probably won't lean towards calling him a heretic just because he even said a couple of those things. I know other things that's about his life. I've listened to him preach the gospel, too. So I don't know. There are people out there that I would put the capital H on much sooner than I will build somebody like Billy Graham. But these are characteristics, four characteristics. I want to kind of get down through these. And I could probably add a lot more. Of what a false teacher is going to look like. Number one is this. The world loves and receives him. What, what do I mean when I say the world? What's that? Yeah, pe people outside the church, people that have never been regenerated, they don't have the mind of Christ, they don't have the spirit, that they don't know Christ, love them. They love them. They like, they, they'll listen to them many times, and I'm going to say all of them, but many times they will be on the New York Times bestseller list. And people buy their books. Sometimes they are at the, um, I don't know what it's called now. It used to be Christian Life Bookstore. Um, what's, what's it called? Is it Lifeway. Tra Tracy knows I'm a little, uh, in the law enforcement arena, it's called 1096. I'm a little crazy over stuff. That's just another S. I don't know why they came on my mind. Sorry. Um, I'm a little 1096 sometimes over stuff when I walk into those stores. And she, know, she knew I took pictures of books. Here's a solid dude right next to a very questionable person. So th this, that's not a ministry. That's a, a business. Use discerning eyes when you go shopping in Christian books. Ones are professing to be Christian bookstores. But the world loves them. There's ones, if I was to name one, one, one this morning that I have family members that I'm about 90% sure that do not know Christ, they're not walking with Christ, love this guy, quote his stuff all the time. That's a red flag for me. If the non-believing world, if those that don't know Christ, don't have the mind of Christ, the spirit living in them, love them, like them or whatever, receive what they have to say, that's a, that's a red flag for me. Listen to what Jesus what says here, Luke 6 and 26. Jesus speaking, he says, What sorrow, or some translations will say, Woe to you, what sorrow awaits you, who are praised by the crowds or praised by all men. For their ancestors also praised false prophets. When you're praised by the crowds or you're praised by all men, as Ramona said, as you're praised by those that are outside the church, if you're well received by people that do not know Christ, woe to you. What are you, what are you teaching? What are you preaching? Why do they praise you? Why are they drawn to you? This is what is said in John chapter 15, 18, and 19. 
If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. And I want to kind of put an asterisk next to that, what Christ is saying. We're not called to go out and make people hate us. We're not called to go out and, and be offensive and, you know, and, and just live you know, however, you know, just pound people with the gospel message to a place where we're actually offensive. The message itself, the gospel, is offensive to people that don't want the gospel. We're called just to give the truth, speak the truth in love, be gentle and respectful. We've looked at that first, uh, Peter 3.15, Ephesians 4. Speak it in love. The truth's going to offend people if they don't want Christ. It will offend them when they say, so what do you mean that Christ is the only way? We should marvel at the fact that a holy God would make any way for sinful man. And he's made one. It's Christ. But see, when we say that, when Christ is the only way, He is the only mediator between God and man, He is the one that you must trust and believe in. He is the only one that's taken on your sin. He is the only one that can forgive you. He is the only one that's going to set you apart and put you on the path towards God. People hate it. See, false teachers won't say that. They'll go on things like Larry King Live. And when asked the question, is Christ the only way, they will say no. He's not. He's not the only way. There's other paths. There's other ways to God. Red flag. The person that said that's a pastor. A pastor. He should at least be speaking the truth, preaching the word. So the world's going to hate you when you live for Christ, not doing it in a way that's, uh, you know, that, that it's, you know, you're trying to get people to hate you. You're just living your life for Christ. It's going to naturally come. This is what John says in 1 John chapter 4, 5, and 6. That those people, now he's referring to the beginning of, of chapter 4 and verse 1, talking about that many false uh, uh, people have went out into the world. He says this, those people, those, and that's who he's referring to, belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to the God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception or the spirit of error. Now, who's this us that he's talking about? It's John writing to church, to the church. There's nobody in John 1 1, 1 John 1 1, there's no, no address like he addresses uh, uh, this, this elect lady and her children, or he addresses um, Gaius in 3 John, in 2 and 3 John. But he's addressing the, the church kind of in a general way. And he, and he speaks is us or we. Who, who's he talking about when he says that? When they hear, they need to hear us. They need to stay with us. He actually says in First John that these false people have actually left us. They went out into the world. What's that? Yeah, the body of Christ. That's who he's talking about. I mean, obviously he's talking about John. He's alive writing the letter. And he's talking about what I would call Orthodox Christianity, the body of Christ. They've went outside of that. When you, when you study a lot of these false folks that I have studied... They've started out somewhere in an orthodox belief. What I mean by orthodox is something that is believed by what I would call solid Christianity. But they've left out of it and they've done something else. They begin to teach other things. So the world loves and receives false teachers. They're well received by the unbelieving world. Point number two, or characteristic or fruit number two, is that they enjoy or they pursue fame and titles. They love titles. So-and-so's ministry. I cringe when I see people's names on something. It's not your ministry. It's not your ministry. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Christ is the focus. Honoring God is the focus. God's Word is the focus. Not you. Listen to what Jesus says about Pharisees and scribes or uh, these religious people specifically, but he's speaking... If you read Matthew 23 to this idea of false teachers among them, because he referenced them back there, we looked at that in Matthew 7. Listen to how, what people really enjoy. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, the teachers of religious law, which were scribes and the Pharisees, and then he talks some things about them. There's a lot of things he talks about, what, what they look like. Now verse 5. Everything they do is for show. On their arms they wear extra wide prayer boxes, even on their foreheads. You know, most likely they've contained uh, Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, which is something Israel uh, always quoted on their heads. They look very religious, uh, these scripture verses inside. And they wear robes with extra long tassels. 
And they love to sit at the head of tables, or the head of table and banquets, and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi. Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your spiritual father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah, that's Jesus Christ. Um, the, the greatest among you must be a servant. How many people have you ever seen that love this? The doctor, reverend, so John Doe. The most holy, reverend, the most right holy. I mean, they, I, mean I think they sit around and like, how can I add another title in front of my name or behind my name, but I want it around my name. Uh, it's a joke. Actually, I don't think Carson's in here this morning. We were joking here. <laughs> like, some of you guys call me Pastor John. I cringe, but I accept it. I, I get it. I know what you're saying. To be a pastor, to be an elder, to be whatever is a position or it's a gift. Ephesians 4 says that he gifts the church, pastors and teachers. It's a gift. It's just a gifting to be able to teach, to live as an example, to, to lead, and I sometimes question that. I can't stand the titles. What, what does Jesus say here? We're all brothers and sisters together, just with different gifts. But people love titles. They love them. This is the one that drives me crazy. I'll just be very upfront with you. Because when I see people calling themselves the Apostle something, capital A, Apostle just simply, the word means a messenger, one who is sent. One, actually, one of the requirements talks about this. To be an apostle, you had to see Christ. Ephesians 2, um, I think it's verse 20, says that he established the church on apostles and prophets. We have evangelists, we have, and I'm not saying, listen, we're all small, lowercase a apostles, we're all messengers of God. In some way. But he does give some to be evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. It's a gift that he gives. But they love the titles. Listen to what John, we looked at this when we walked through third John, when John is writing there to Gaius about somebody in this church. He says, I wrote to the church about this, talking about uh, um, helping uh, true evangelists, two, true ministers of the gospel along financially and however else. He says, I wrote to the church about that. But he says, but Diotrephes who loves to be the leader or loves to have the preeminence, is what, say, New King James or ESV will say. The, he loves the preeminence, refuses to have anything to do with us. Diotrephes loves to have the focus. He probably was strutting around the church. He loved for people to say things about him. Actually, it'll continue and says that he, he, he uh, prates. Is that the right word, Trace? I always get that word off. Prates. He prates around. He says crazy words. I mispronounce things up here, just so you know, sometimes. And my um, daughter, who is studying English um, at Shippensburg, uh, usually corrects me by the afternoon, um, which I'm glad she does. It's cool. It says, the Diotrephes was prating around with malicious words, talking about the Apostle John and those. They love, see, he loves to be the leader. He loves to have the preeminence amongst the church. And he puts, and he puts people out of the church, he goes on to say, that want to help other Christians. You know, that, the reason why I wanted to... And I was very great. I'm just trying to be gracious this morning. Um, put names up because I was watching Paul. I look at John here in Third John. He calls Diotrephes out by name. Paul calls two guys out in uh, Second uh, Timothy one um, by name. He says their message, or in the church, he says their message is spreading like a disease, and I got to cut that off. If you go back to First Timothy, he says of one of those guys, he says, I actually had to deliver him over to Satan so that he wouldn't blaspheme the truth. There's people that are called out sometimes by name. Revelation chapter 2, in the end of 2, um, Christ really speaking through John to this church in Ephesus um, really applauds something that they were doing there in the life of that church. He says, you have examined the claims, they're making claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. See, we're to examine people that make claims of leadership, of apostleship, whatever. False teachers, examine what they have to say, examine their lives. So they enjoy fame and they enjoy titles. 
The third characteristic of fruit is this. They pursue, they teach, they enjoy. Remember the old show, The Lifestyle of the Rich and Famous? Remember that old show, like, was it 20 years ago, 15 years ago? The Lifestyle of the Rich and Famous. They would go and highlight some rich billionaire in the world and just kind of these episodes that were on, whatever. That's why I titled it that. That's what these people love. They love the lifestyle of the rich and famous. That goes right along with the warning that, uh, that Jude gives us in his letter that, about Balaam, running greedily after profit. If you know that story in Numbers, that's exactly what he did. He would prophesy against the children of Israel for dollars, for money. It's all about money. Listen to what Ezekiel, back in the Old Testament, remember Peter tells us that they were back there in the Old Testament, they're going to be in here, the church as well. Listen to what Ezekiel has to say. Really, listen to what God has to say through Ezekiel. Chapter 34, 1 through 3. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. If you go back to Jeremiah 23 and read, that's a long section. God has a, uh, he has several woes, several pronouncements against the shepherds who take care of themselves instead of taking care of God's people and teaching them the word of God. They speak visions and dreams and things that God says is not from me. You don't teach them my words. And woe to you. How many times, this is what you will hear. Brother, if you sow your best gift, if you sow your best gift, you know, you always reap what you sow. The, the more that you sow, the more that you will reap. And where is this person asking for the money, your check, to go to? Is it going to missions work in Africa? Is it going to the local church? To him, to her. If they really believed that message, if that was a true message, why aren't they sowing into everybody else? Send your greatest, I'm going to be honest with you, this is long before me and Trace became believers. Um, when we first got married, um, she had a, just a minor health thing going on. I was kind of scared. I was desperate. I was 23, didn't know what to think, and turned on the TV, and I'm going to call him this morning. Robert Tilton was on TV. If you sow your greatest gift to me, I will mail you a anointed prayer cloth and some water that I've prayed over, and God will, and then he begins to list them out, and then he spoke to me, I for sure, and he will heal your loved one. And I wasn't a believer at the time. I'm like, oh, I grew up in church, well, maybe that's for me. What happens is people that are on set incomes and older people, they hear that stuff, they're hurting, they're struggling, and they fall in to pray with people like that. And they'll stroke out that last $1,000 check. I don't remember what it was, and Trace, I didn't send, did I send money? I might have fallen, I don't know. I don't think, I remember it was 50 bucks that I was going to send for my magical prayer cloth so that Tracy wouldn't have to go through what she's about, and it was just minor health issue, it was nothing. But Robert Tilton's been exposed since then. Secular media has exposed him as a, as a jokester, as a, he's a charlatan. That's what they look like. They feed themselves. But send your best gift. And they will take things like, you know, the verses in the Bible that, you know, what we, how we sow is how we're going to reap. But it's not all about money. It's not about money. Second Peter chapter 2 and verses three says, verse 3 says this. Now, remember, he's, re, he's coming right off that section that there will be false teachers among you. It says, in their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. I mean, how clear is that? But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. They deceive many to get your money, because they're greedy. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 2. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty or perilous times, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud and arrogant. He lists some other things there. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying his power. The instruction is to avoid such people. When I read that section, a lot of people will take 2 Timothy 3 there and they will apply that to the world. Listen, the world's always been like that. I was like that. 
still kind of like some of those things. It's God's still working on stuff. But when I read that in context, when I read chapter, actually I just read the whole entire letter that Paul writes to him. But when I read it within, say, say chapter 3 into chapter 4, he's speaking to the church. In context of what he's saying there, he's speaking to the church. But in the, understanding in the last days, this is what church folk are going to look like. They're going to be lovers of self. They're going to be lovers of money, arrogant, proud, disobedient to parents. He goes on through this list. Lovers of pleasure, they, re, they look very religious, but they deny the power to live right and holy lives. They deny the power to go out and make disciples. I mean, there's all kinds of things we can look at. I, I believe that he's writing to the church. Those people, people that creep in. Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. For there are many rebellious people, and he's referring to people that are kind of teaching and have influence on the church. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. Uh, this is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. So some Jews that, that kind of believed in Jesus were still trying to add Old Testament things, were creeping into the churches there in the island of Crete. Verse 11, they must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for dollars, money. They do it for money. First Timothy chapter 6, 5 and 6. And then verses 9 through 11, listen to what Paul says here. Uh, These people always cause trouble, referring to people that have an influence in the church. Anyone that is a false teacher, their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Yet true godliness is with contentment, I'm sorry, yet true godliness with contentment um, is itself great wealth. Then he kind of says this, But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish, harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, it's not money, it's the love of money. They love money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, not everybody, but some people craving money, they have a love for money, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now listen, here's, this is the contrast, verse 11. But you... Here's this description. This is what they look like. They love money. They crave money. But you, Timothy, are a man of God. That's, where we, that's, that's the things that we should be pursuing. If Paul was to write a letter to each one of us, could he say that about you? But you, and put your name in there. But you, and put your name in there, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. And this is what we're to pursue. Pursue righteousness and godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance and gentleness. Do you ever hear any of them talking about pursuing those things? No. It's always about money or send your money my way and you'll be blessed. The fourth and last one will kind of bring this thing to an end this morning. Like I said, there's so much stuff that I was looking at uh, as, as fruit of false teachers in the Scripture. God, God warns us because it's dangerous. Number four is that they preach and teach the wisdom of the world and not God's Word. They teach the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The very thing that Eve snuck into the garden, I'm sorry, Eve, she was in the garden. The Satan snuck into the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. The very thing that Satan did to Jesus as well when he was tempted. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They preach the world's wisdom. Listen. This is just a small section out of that, the, the section I would love for you guys to read, Jeremiah 23. Listen to what God says about false shepherds. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to, the, to those who despise me, The Lord has said. How many have heard, have heard this from some of these folks? Touch not thy anointed. When you, when you, I don't know if you, I've heard it from the guy that I read and threw the book away one time. When people were blasting him, he says, how dare you touch the anointed of God. There's a scripture reference for that, taken completely out. That's what they'll say. Don't touch me. I speak for the Lord. You shall, you shall have peace. When in reality, there is no peace coming because judgment was coming. That's what was happening. But they speak lies. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, Jeremiah will later say what? The heart is what? Deceitful or desperately wicked who can know it. Be careful that you're, 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 not, you're being led by your heart instead of the God's Word. If you know God's Word, you're going to have a new heart. 
uh, be careful of, of the heart, especially these folks that are talking. The dictates of the heart. They say, no evil should come upon you, but evil was coming. God was bringing judgment. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? And the answer is, none of you. None of you have heard from my voice. Who has marked his word and heard it? None of you is what God is saying. Verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and has caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from to turn them from their, turn the people from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. If they would have been watchmen like uh, Ezekiel was in Ezekiel 33, when they saw the word, the, the sword coming, and they spoke truth to the people, God says, you know what? They may have repented, and they may not have had to go into Babylon. I mean, that's the context of what's being said here. But the problem is, these people speak, and even in 2018, they claim they speak for God, and God looks at them and says, you know what? I never put my words in your mouth. You're a liar. You test those that say they're apostles and you find them to be liars. And we'll close with this. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is really um, how we stay safe. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge you, he's talking to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. This is what he says to Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, but according to their own desires, their fleshly desires, because they have itching ears, they only want to hear soothing things, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their eyes away from the truth and be turned aside to fables or be turned aside to things that are just simply myths. They're made up. There's just, they tell stories. How many of these guys that you'll see on this, these recommendations on Facebook or you watch, that they'll be up on a, in a pretty cool looking platform and they've got a lot of folks listening to them. They're, they normally don't even have a pulpit and they don't have one of these. But they're teaching. And they're saying soothing words. They're saying cool things, interesting things, things that kind of, that's, man, amen, brother. And you, and then the cameras and these mega churches will pan, go, go down to the audience, and people are writing fervently, like, like this dude's saying something. And I've watched this one guy that James alluded to several weeks ago. The same message that he speaks, is probably speaking right now, will be the same one he's, he's going to speak next Sunday, and he's going to be the same one he just spoke last Sunday, just reworked a little bit. And what they'll do is they'll take God's word, if they take it, They'll twist it a little bit out of complete context. They'll just take it out of context, and it's the same stuff. They preach to your flesh. And I was sharing with, I don't know if it was Jim or someone this morning, I'm not as ang angry. Sometimes I do get angry. Remember it says that we, we hate every false way, Psalm 119, because we know it's injurious to people. It does make me angry sometimes, and I'm not as angry or frustrated with uh, these people that I would title that uh, have issues as much as that the people that sit there. They would not have a platform if they didn't have a boatload of folks endorsing their message and wanting their message. If the people left and didn't come back, their voice goes away. But what happens? In the end days, that time is here. The time has come. The people no longer want sound teaching. They no longer want God's word. They don't want the truth. And sometimes you have to rebuke. God's word rebukes us in love. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon says about this time. The time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Let that sink in. That time is here. But the shepherds are no longer, as Paul exhorts Timothy, preach the word, convince, rebuke, with all long suffering and patience, stay in sound doctrine. Teach people God's word. These people that title themselves pastors, if they're not teaching people God's word, the entire counsel of God's word, they're going to have to stand before him one day. Woe to them. Woe to them. And that's something that you guys probably should pray about for me, is that I'm never enticed away from God's word. That I have a hunger for God's word. Jeremiah will actually say that your words burn in my bones like fire, that I love God's word, that I want to know it. For real, I just don't want to simply preach my opinions from it. Just let God's word go and let it do it what God's word does. It never returns to him void. 
let's close. Um, next Sunday, what I want to do is I'm going to look at several ways on how we can actually guard ourselves against the influence of false teachers and their teachings. Because they're everywhere. We're bombarded by them. We're bombarded by them. Let's pray. Father.